So I did engage each of the canopies and I went in to see, could I uh, get engaged with the angelic realm and understand their function related to me rather than their function related to God? Because if I'm seated on a throne, which I am, and we all are seated in heavenly places, then that canopy comes around me when I'm seated on my throne in that position of identity. So they're designed also to help me in my sonship identity in ruling and reigning in that position. I've been listening to your uh, Unconditional Love series. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the 12 ages of man and the 12 ages within each age. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it either, to be honest. Um, basically, when when I started to engage um, the 12 chancellor's houses and engage the sort of the, the Maseroth, uh, as was um, sort of the external wheels within the wheels, within the wheels, all of that dynamic and sort of dimensional realities of the cosmos and how we're placed within the cosmos which rotates every twenty five thousand years or so um which i don't think any of us really want to be involved in twenty five thousand years of cosmic stuff really um but then there's the wheels within the wheels which is the 12 chancellors houses which is how when we begin to engage with god's government then we begin to facilitate the changes in times and seasons which affect our lives so there are those who would teach uh, horoscopes you know the zodiac the 12 so we're born under a particular star sign therefore our life has been mapped out in some fatalistic way or is influence that means that our personality type is dictated by what star system we were born on and that type of stuff and then that goes into horoscopes and trying to predict or by looking at the stars and all of that. Now, that's not what the cosmos was designed to be or how it was designed to be taken. Um, there are influences which may have some sort of effect on our lives from the frequency um, where we live, but God intends us to come into a maturity of ascension and our identity in sonship through a process that takes us through cycles of change and those cycles of change initially were designed to bring about our maturity and then those cycles of change because we have been in the state we've been in are designed around the transformation of our lives or the renewal of our minds or processes that reveal our identity and reveal who God is. And so the 12 chancellor's houses operate in governmental groups of three that then open a window for the manifestation of those houses. And those houses are, are governed by chancellors who are responsible for our helping us come into that position of maturity. And so the first chancellor's house would be the precepts of God, which is the revelation of who God is in experience that then engages the statutes of God, which are how our thinking aligns with God's thinking about us so we experience god in a new way it changes our thinking about him and us and then the laws of god are the outworking of the statutes and the uh, the precepts and the statutes in our lives so it changes how we begin to function and then that opens up another door or another thing to the next three and that forms the window so bringing the present and what will be the future into a window that begins to manifest the ordinances of God, which are the positions we are in within God's government that opens doors for us. To, and that can be physical positions, that can be spiritual positions. So we tend to go through these cycles. So we encounter God, 
changes our thinking, changes how we're functioning, and then opens up opportunities for us to outwork that functioning in everyday life or in heaven, depending on what it's related to. And then those then then go into the next three, which then begin to open up mantles and scrolls. So the position we're in gives us new authority. We're clothed with that authority. That then gives us a, a new access to aspects of our purpose, if you like, our identity that enables those scrolls to be outworked in our life. So God may give us new things in which to operate in. And then that takes us into further cycles, opens up the next one. So there's like four sides of a cube, say sort of you know, looking at Metacons cube or looking at the Merkaba as a, as a cube within the core of it that takes us through those cycles. And ultimately it br brings about the new discoveries. It brings about changes in the affairs of our life, the culture of our life, and then eventually reveals opening up the resources to our life, which bring, brings us back to the precepts of God again. And that cycle can take place again. And when when I first discovered this, I realized that this had been happening all my life. That God had encountered me in such a way that revealed something. It totally changed my thinking or began to change my thinking. And then everything was like, wow, life is different. Now, my angel that is associated with my position in heaven, my throne, was facilitating this taking place by coordinating with the 12 chancellors, my chancellors, coordinating with them to facilitate cycles of change in my life. And so I went through many cycles of these things without me really understanding the process. It just I read a book, opened up my eyes to something of God totally different, really changed my thinking. Then everything focused at working that. And I went through that cycle many times. Baptism of the Spirit was one cycle. Probably the first cycle I remember going through was when I read Watchman Nee's book about the normal Christian life. And that was like my Christian life as a teenager was anything but normal based on what that book said. But that totally transformed my thinking to thinking I'm living an abnormal Christian life. Therefore, I want normality. Uh, and therefore, I began to see that my life was not dictated to by my behavior or everything else. So everything changed from the perspective of that in quite a you know a profound way same with baptism of the spirit read a book nine o'clock in the morning that opened my eyes to something took me on a cycle and i went through many cycles like that often god used books because he couldn't get my attention much other way you know in a day i wasn't able to hear his voice i wasn't functioning in this relationship of intimacy so from that perspective he used what he could to change and put me on these cycles now that i realized was not just all of us are individually going through those cycles but also there are larger cycles that affect larger groups of people or cultures of people that are designed to move us all into an awakening so that we can corporately engage the mind of christ you know we become a a a, a engaged agreement if you like with god that that happens um and in history you can see the great awakenings take place when people begin to come into agreement now be in the inner wheel of the wheels within the wheels within the wheels god spoke to me about there are 12 12 ages of man that were designed for stages of ascension and there were ambassadors of those ages that were like the 12 chancellors who were taking or taking what God's desire was for our uh, transformation, our increase in ascension in sonship, and were responsible for helping us outwork that in our lives. So this isn't really talking about ages as in periods of time in the same way as we think about you know the neolithic age or the you know the bronze age or the iron age or anything else this is really talking about 
us coming into an ascended state of maturity um, and I know people talk about ages today in like, well, the church age and the kingdom age and the age of Melchizedek. And they have all these sort of, I think, defining periods, which really are not real periods of time. But God does something and it seems like, oh, we've changed the age. you know. But really what's happening is we're becoming mature and we're seeing things from a different perspective. And those ages um, are related to our maturity we're effectively become so you could think of it as we started off as babies we became toddlers then we became infants then became juniors and then we became teenagers and then we became adults it's a sort of you know but there but there are 12 ages 12 stages of our maturation if you like growth in sonship that give us access to the firestones of god which are linked to these ages so the firestones are encounters that bring revelation and each stone is a step of maturity in various different levels and i believe there are 12 encounters because there were i first encountered nine stones but then god showed me that we were to bring three more stones so the nine stones reflected the nine stones that were um ref there and it talks about in the firestones were reflected on lucifer's body hence he was there to reflect god's glory as he made us in his image and likeness so we could begin to be transformed into that likeness through the light that was reflected and each one of those would have been one of the nine firestones but the encounters on the firestones that I've had, God then said, you are to become, you know, in our image and likeness. Therefore, there are three stones that are going to be reflecting man's ascension. So you get the 12 stones on the high priest breastplate are reflections of the government of God. And those 12 stones are also seen in the New Jerusalem, in the foundations and the walls, which are built on 12 levels if you like of revelation or truth or knowledge or wisdom different ways of looking at it or perspectives that you're seeing um so what i sort of discovered in the journey and god talked to me about a little bit is as we mature and we've come into the fullness of the nine which is three of god th three times three three spirit three father three son then we then will add our three of sonship to those three and the our government is the fullness of god nine plus our three hence 12. Um, so that was sort of part of this process of growth and maturity that and i realized that you know there were um 12 engagements with the firestones so that meant 12 ages if you like, of engaging the firestones, not just there would be 12 stones, but there were 12 within that 12. So for each 12 of a period of, of maturity or an age of our ascension, there were 12 stones within the 12. You see what I mean? So each stone of the firestones were, there were 12 encounters that each of us would have in our lives to bring us into that place of maturity. And I think that's really what the the 12 ages of man were about. Um, not talking about 12 ages in history, but 12 stages of ma maturity that come into a, the fullness of sonship. And the father said, when you've ascended the 12 steps, you will become an ascended father. And I think this is future in which we will then take on the creative role as a father in the way that God intends that to be. And I wouldn't want to, for us to try and figure that out or work that out now, yeah. what it might mean. But I do believe it is something to do with a co-creating capacity that we have for future increase in God's government um, and peace. Um, so that that's how I would sort of perceive it to be. Now, it was quite a cryptic comment when God first spoke it to me. Um, and to be honest, I've not really felt 
a desire to really go deep into it because I feel it's more of a mystery that will be unveiled as we mature within those Firestone processes and within our Ascension steps. Um, and I've probably talked about it more here now than I've ever talked about it before because I do that. You know, I start sharing something when it comes to this that I've never really thought about but actually is the revelation that I've received um, because this is life, really. It's, it's our growth. Our, our God has designed us to, to become into maturity and to express who we are made in his image and likeness. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a process um, that is, there are those who are responsible for helping us in this process like the 12 chancellors are helping us in the cycles of change, the 12 ambassadors actually are ambassadors of those firestone encounters to help us when we go through those cycles. Each one of those has 12 steps and there are 12 encounters. So there's 144 sort of experiences or encounters that they are facilitating and helping us um in this thing now do you need to know all that to have it take place in your life no not not really but if you do and you recognize then it's easier to cooperate you don't have to know the details and i don't know the detail i know that i have had at least nine firestone encounters so i've had nine encounters on nine stones then the tenth encounter births the tenth stone and therefore there's 10 and then the 11th the 11th stone and the 12th the 12th stone um, and this sort of is not just me as an individual um, this was sort of god i think saying hey mankind is going to come into a whole new level that will birth new ages of uh, experience and sonship in the future and so i did birth three stones and i because i think god was figuratively showing me what was to come for all of us um and so i've not really majored on it um, but i did work go through the experiences so ultimately i think you know we're designed to go through this processes now whether we go through nine encounters with nine stones and then we go through the 10th encounter that produces the 10th stone um, or whether we go through 12 encounters with 12 stones i'm not totally sure but in reality that was the sort of the gist of what i was being shown and what i had experienced to date um, can you refresh my memory what the uh, three stones of, of, of the main is well it's just related to spirit soul body Okay. So, we are so as their father son spirit that each of them has three stones which produces the nine of god which reflects those nine stones those nine initial fire stones then god has brought us into government and therefore we will then contribute you could say three of mankind but i guess each individually will have an, a part to play in that maybe okay great that was awesome thank you so yeah it's interesting um for most yeah. people they would be like shoot probably go over the top of the head um but it's okay just embrace the process of transformation as you experience it if you've never well, as you begin talking stuff, yeah excuse me, as you yeah. Begin, begin talking i realize i think i've been in a lot of these cycles that he's talking about but i could not put him put it into words yeah okay great I, I, I think that happens with a lot of people who don't know the details of all this just as i didn't in my life but i can now look back and i can see the cycles that i've been on mm -hmm. that god initiated that then i cooperated with some less so than others because it was such a challenge to my thinking it took time for my mind to be renewed before it affected how I lived. 
And then before then it opened up doors of opportunity to move into something new, whether that be a new place or a new role or a new position in God or, or just something unveiled, something deeper, you know, um, but as I then saw the transfers houses, I didn't know how they worked. I mean, I encountered all the 12 houses. I engaged the high chancellors. It was like, wow. First few things were just like, this is weird stuff. Because it was very figurative or very symbolic. In the, in the um, I remember going into the, the precepts house and it was like there were all these windows there. That when I looked through, I was looking into the eternal now of God, the perichoresis, the a principle of God, a precept of God I'd never seen before. And some of them were almost eternal principles or things beyond my earthly experience, but there were windows in there that facilitated me seeing into it before I could ever enter into it, which eventually I was able to do. I saw. And even seeing a glimpse of something was just life transforming or certainly sometimes disorientating to my present belief system. Um, and I think some of those were the cognitive dissonance things that got set up in my life. It's like this doesn't compute, but it's like it feels really good, but it doesn't compute. So where do I go? You know, so I went through many stages of that. But then I saw that as i engaged i went into the the house uh the second house you know which was full of eyes and it was just like ah, oh, you know and you remember some of the angels had eyes on their wings and all these you know eyes within the wheels and it was just like whoa this is weird stuff and it, and it felt weird you know i couldn't relate to it in a sense because it, it was just too weird all these eyes you know, but actually the statutes of God are the revelation of how God's thoughts are and how you see things and perceive things. So it made sense later on. Think, oh, yeah, there are all these ways, new ways of perceiving life or perceiving God or perceiving myself. So that that changed how I saw things. My thinking changed. And that was symbolically expressed to me as all of these eyes you know that were in everything it seemed like i just couldn't it was a weird you know like you can imagine ezekiel trying to describe what he was seeing you know of these wheels within wheels and eyes and you know it's like he's, he's trying his best to describe something which is really outside of his you know normal everyday experience in life and that's what it was like for me so i'm seeing this stuff but it's just too weird what is this you know but as i re-engaged it because i had all of the encounters with them one after the other and they were all like whoa all too much to take in you know the discovery house and the stuff there and it was just like oh look at all these scrolls of things it's like you know and i'm like what yeah uh, but you know i went back and i re-engaged and then I was, then I said, well, how does this work? You know, how does this actually work? You know, because then I saw and God showed me how this is sort of centered around the, a cube in four faces. And then, of course, you've got the four faces of God and there's lots of fours, the four windows of heaven. And these were all sort of, again, linked into this type of thing that gave some insight into my growth and maturity in the four faces of god in the order of melchizedek because they were linked in which helped me then realize that me being a priest or a king or an oracle or a legislator needed these groups of houses to operate together to open up a window that took me into a next stage of growth you know i couldn't you know, initially it was, you know, I look back and saw it happen, but then God showed me, and particularly when I then did a court case based on the Joshua generation within the Council of 70, these cycles became what I worked with to bring about 
the changes within the Joshua generation that I was legislating for. You know, but now, you know, I didn't understand any of that the first time I encountered it. But I'm sort of a bit like a dog with a bone. When I get something, either I will stick it, ponder it in my heart and it will be there. Or I will just feel like pursuing it until I get deeper revelation or experience or knowledge and wisdom with it. And some things, you know, I know are there. And then God will just bring me back to another encounter that will open up something more and open up something more. And that's what happened. You know, I went through cycles of change um, that facilitated these things. And then later then I saw these correlate with my Firestone experiences. The Firestones were such a, a revolutionary encounter that it so changed my whole perspective and how I saw God. And, you know, so I realized, hey, this is this is all linked. You know, but I had no idea about that in the beginning. You know, um, so I think we're all on this journey. And I think mankind is on this journey <coughs> as a corporate entity, not just as individuals. We're all because it so it talks a lot about all mankind were you know, reconciled and all mankind were justified and all mankind were made righteous. And there's this sense of a progression, really, of, of growth and maturity. It's interesting we're, we're on this topic this morning because um, I, you know, I've been, uh, well, let me say I have a question to ask you, but I have to confess I've been stuck a bit. Uh, and it's been a while, you know, maybe a couple, two, three, four, I don't know how many years it's been, but I had this experience, which I believe are with the, essentially with the, with the um, Merkaba. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, it, I had no, hardly any visual elements going on, but I had these cherubs attached to the back of my neck. And I was really crunching in bed at night. And then I started zooming through the heavens so fast there aren't words to describe. And I could see the stars going by. And then all of a sudden, I had this thought because the whatever, you know, I'm sure it was the chariot that I was in yeah. started to get hit. It almost seemed like it was bouncing all around wildly because it was being hit with all these I thought they might have been stones, but I don't know what it was. And then the thought occurred to me, could this be demonic? And the minute that thought entered in my, into my mind, I just, I got so frightened that the whole thing stopped. <laughs> right. And so I've kind of been in that place right now where it's still difficult. You know, I still haven't been able to um, fully release that, but it's, that's not my question. My question is on the visual of, I was doing some reading, let me just say that, on the coyote. And, um, you know, the visual element of it really interests me. And I was doing some reading. This is not from primary sources. It were either secondary, third, tertiary uh, sources, or even beyond that which seem to bring a little bit of confusion because they're not primary sources. But anyway, there seems to be maybe a slightly different interpretation that people have of the coyote. And I think everybody probably knows that, you know, these are the beings. I mean, it's essentially the Merkaba. It's the beings that drive the chariot of the Godhead, otherwise known as the Merkaba. Mm. And, you know, I think probably everybody here knows the coyote are essentially the living creatures, the Zoe, as they're sometimes called, as it's, you know, described as, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, you know, the creatures that, you know, have the, the cherubs, the cherubim, uh, which are depicted, you know, with the body of a, of a human and the four wings and the eyes all over the wings and the body. And they also have the tetramorph or the, the four faces of God, right, which reflects the different aspects of God. And then next to them, you know, if you could kind of get a visual, if you haven't seen it already, you've got the ophanim, which are the wheels within wheels that are turning. 
Yeah. And and then above, you know, above the man, above the Godhead, you have the seraphim, right, which are the fiery serpent um, beings with the six wings. But where things get a bit confusing, first, one of the sources I was reading, I almost had a sense, you know, that the cherubs were something else. I think that was just totally off. But there's also the usage of this term thrones. And that's what in particular got me a little bit confused because I'm thinking, okay, what are the thrones? Are they the cherubim? Are they the seraphim? Are they the coyote itself, the entire Merkaba? Or, you know, what are they talking about, Mike? What, I mean, maybe you can kind of unpack this. <laughs> Okay. There seems to be usages of terms that, you know, yeah. alternate depending on who's describing this. Yeah. I mean, where where you get the terminology often comes from how angels are described in Hebrew. And they're usually called angels or they might be called seraphim or cherubim, but some of the others aren't named. They're just described as angels or described as a term when actually in reality there are an order of angels that people ha don't really connect to. Obviously, you've got the ophanim and the, and the chaos and all of those. Um, now, there is the see, there is the sort of external um, perspective of the throne of God and the Merkaba relating to all this but there is the internal that is operating in us so the merkaba is at the core of our being and represents the identity of god in us um, which brings about the focus of spirit soul and body in union with father son and spirit in the core of our being and actually it's probably more important to get that than it is to understand you know, the canopy of angels around the throne of God and all the four living creatures and all of that, which is very interesting. And they're obviously, you know, it's obviously mentioned in Revelation and in other places. And there are, you know, a canopy of angels and they do have functions raising up from the throne of God, you know, all the way up to sort of the weird ones, you know, the the chaos, which are the living creatures, which are not necessarily humanoid, but are living. You know, it gets all pretty weird. Um, some of it is, okay, does it really matter what all that is about? Because God will give us insight when we need it, when we encounter it, or do we need to understand it? And therefore, you know, when I first started to hear about the canopy of angels and the different, you know, the 10,000 times 10,000 angels and the myriad of angels and all of that, what are they all about? And it seemed to be just like, whoa, this is all a little bit more than I can take in. And actually, the, that's what God is like from his majesty and the throne of God. And all of that is just like it's supposed to be awesome. It's supposed to be in somewhat a mystery. And it's supposed to make us or you know, in awe of the amazing things that are around the throne of God. But it's also supposed to be part of how we can then engage with the angelic realm ourselves in our own sonship, you know, but when I get to the throne of God, I just want to fall on my face. I just want to honor and you know, be in awe of and totally yield and surrender to it. So there's many different levels of revelation towards each one. So the four living creatures, which are connected and obviously Ezekiel described a four headed being the cherub nature of man being four headed reflecting the four living creatures which were reflecting the order of melchizedek so do i literally have a, a head of an, an ox and an, an an eagle and a man no i don't i mean i have a face of a man but do i have a cherubic nature which ha was how god designed us to function in the order of melchizedek as a priest a king an oracle and a legislator yes and so there are aspects of who i am that are eagle like in figurative terms you know i don't soar around in the sky but i carry legislative 
governmental authority in terms of my identity. I am an oracle, so I have characteristics of the ox that are reflected in me being a voice of God when I begin to speak his oracles from his heart. You know, there's the king, the government and the priest. So you have my nature as a royal priest and an oracle and a legend. Now, they, that's associated with the four living creatures and the cherubic nature and the cherub th themselves having those characteristics. I don't totally need to understand it all and all the symbolism, because it is quite weird to embrace it. I embrace my identity within the order of Melchizedek and I've engaged the four faces of God and I've stood in each face and I've stood within the name of God, which is representative of my authority and my power of attorney, attorney in his name to use my identity as a son to speak his heart, his intention, his purpose to create reality around my life. So I sort of understand how it relates to those aspects. I don't think God, we need to understand how it totally relates to the throne of God and the glory and majesty of God. That's supposed to be awe inspiring mystery. And I don't think we need to understand it fully, but where I engage with the the 12 can layers of angels or whatever yeah, the different layers of angels are and the canopy of angels is how does that relate to how they can function in helping me in my sonship? So I did engage each of the canopies and I went in to see, could I uh, get engaged with the angelic realm and understand their function related to me rather than their function related to God. Because if I'm seated on a throne, which I am, and we all are seated in heavenly places, then that canopy comes around me when I'm seated on my throne in that position of identity. So they're designed also to help me in my sonship identity in ruling and reigning in that position. So I began to engage the different angelic beings to begin to see was there something I needed to know that would help me in my sonship and therefore I related to the angelic canopy I also began to engage with the court of angels and participate by sharing there which then drew angels to support and encourage and help because they are ministering spirits for those who are inheritors of salvation do I understand all of the terminology and all of their function related to God's throne and God's glory? No, but I do have some insight into how they relate to us and our throne and where we're seated and our identity, because that's our glory. Our glory is our identity and creation will be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, us living in our full identity in sonship. So there is aspects of this that are related to us to reflect and help us come into that identity. Um, now, you know, do these angelic beings have multiple functions and multiple titles, perhaps, that some people relate to them in different ways, in different names within their function? And I think that may be where some of the confusion comes in, in that they may well have different names. Who are the 12 ambassadors of the ages? Who are the 12 ambassadors? What order of angels are they? Or are they separate orders of angels? Who are the court of judges? You know, there are different names. Who are the 24 elders? You know, there's sort of all sorts of questions that we could ask that can be seeming like wow this is uh, yeah i need to know an awful lot of stuff here but i don't think we really do need to function everyday life i think there's more to discover and i think in different ways people describe it differently as they relate to it in their life where they are on their journey mm -hmm. which may well be different so you know just because people talk about it differently they're talking about it through their perspective of their engagement with it, mm -hmm. not necessarily as a definition of what it is globally for everybody and for all time. It's almost sort of 
you know, have I engaged with the cherubim? Yes. The seraphim? Yes. The orphanim, the Elohim, the Ben Elohim to a degree. Yes. And they have different names in different positions or different functions. So you could say that the 12 chancellors or high chancellors, because there are many other chancellors, and we can also function as chancellors. I was given by wisdom a seal and a staff that had a seal and a sort of seal around my neck, which was a chancellor's role. And I've engaged the chancellor's court and I have functioned at the bench there to facilitate sort of scrolls and mandates and things being released or accepted and different things you know um now i when i'm not really a detail person so what were the others there look like i wasn't really that sort of taken with what they looked like i was more interested in what they were doing how they were functioning mm -hmm. so i could learn to function i wouldn't look like them now, each one of those chancellors could have been from a different order of angels, for all I know, you know, and therefore, you know, how I related to them there may be very different to how I would relate to them in another type of experience. So it can be quite confusing, I think, because it's not just set in stone. It's mm -hmm. a very fluid, flexible, living dynamic within the realms of heaven. And their mm -hmm. roles may be different in different situations. The angel that sits behind my throne, I don't know what order of angel that is. Although I have a suspicion it might be one of the Ben Elohim. I don't know exactly. God didn't tell me, and I wasn't that curious to find out. So, you know, what, is, what does all that mean? It's more to do with rather than an intellectual exercise for knowledge or a quest for knowledge. It's more how do they relate to my journey and where I am on my journey so I can cooperate with them for the sort of growth that I need to have in maturity. That's how I perceive all of these things. It's all to do with my ascending in levels of maturity rather than a fixed rigid thing that then would apply to everybody because my engagement with the cherubim or the seraphim you know i have engaged with the seraphim they were engaging with me when i was on the altar you know and you know i've engaged with the the, the seven spirits of god you know well are they separate creatures well they seem to be very different from anything else i've experienced so i i my view is yes they are seven created beings what to reflect the fullness of the spirit you know and some people would say well they're just aspects of one spirit well they may well be reflecting aspects of one spirit but actually when i engaged them they were individual personalities pe beings that were reflecting that aspect in my growth in sonship because that's what they were revealing to me with the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and all of the seven and the spirit of the fear of the lord was the one who engaged my scroll and took me into the judgment seat you know so but it, all of it from my perspective has been not an intellectual quest for knowledge or understanding of it but more of a when i come across these things in my journey and in my encounters then i learn to cooperate with them for what they're doing and it, I totally agree. It can be very confusing if we're trying to understand all the different names and different things that, that people are called these different things um, and try and almost put it into a very fixed, rigid format, which I don't think it is or is designed to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Almost more metaphorical. And I tend to think a little more literally at times. You know, I like to have a picture. <laughs> I'm not yeah. saying it is literal in literal experiences encounters i just think sometimes there is a symbolic element to it or a metaphorical element to it that we're supposed to connect to rather than try and literally get it all tied down into some you know here's the book of angels that's going to describe what every angel looks like and what they're 
I'm more involved, more interested in what are they doing when I'm encountering them and how do I relate to what they're doing rather than what do they look like? And, and angels can change their appearance as we know, you know, they don't always look the same, you know, as in sometimes angels appear as human beings, um, which may be very different yeah. from their normal appearance. So you know, I would just encourage you not to be too prescriptive on it mm -hmm. um, and be flexible enough to embrace what they're doing as you experience it rather than see it as, well, I'm, I'm almost defining the angelic realm so I can understand it. I don't think I'll ever understand the angelic realm, particularly when it relates to God, because mm -hmm. yeah, he's just beyond, you know. And I'm not him, therefore I don't think I'm supposed to get it. It's supposed to create this sense of war and wonder when I engage the throne of God and all the amazing things that are going on and the thunders and lightnings and, you know, coloured this, that and the other and rainbows. And I mean, just amazing, you know, sense of awe and wonder and majesty of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was helpful, Mike. And before I forget to ask, did we have the replay? <laughs> I can never find the replay online. Okay, so yeah, I can, I can send you a copy of it, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, all right. Daniel, your hand up there. Uh, good morning, everybody. Oh. Uh, I am having trouble with reception, uh, both video and audio. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Yeah, I can see yes. you and hear you. Yeah. Yep. Good, good. Okay. Uh, first of all, Mike, so glad to be here today. And I'm sorry that uh, it's been a while. Uh, I'll either forget or come on late, whatever the case might be. So, anyhow, um, uh, there's so much, but um, share with me your thoughts. God, for months, uh, as uh, I'm before him and in his presence. He just, uh, so many times, has so overwhelmed me within and with the presence of God immediately that I'm saturated into without. Mm. Held me, cocooned me, however uh, we could express it, in intimate love and relationship and fellowship divine, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where the beauty of the Lord is just upon me. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, I'm so grateful. And uh, I don't really think, in a sense, there's anything greater than that, <laughs> being in that place of intimacy with God. Um, however, I also think God has a purpose of, in kind of keeping me there. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly have been times like yesterday, uh, I've moved in the realms of the heavens and and I've had encounters and uh, experiences and and so on. Uh, and in fact, yesterday, kind of when God landed my encounter with him, he landed me so in the lap of his love and spoke to me, and, and I won't get the quote, I'm sure, but I think the essence was, you are in freedom in me. And... and there's nothing greater than that. There's nowhere else that you want to be. Now, I I would be able to translate that in a number of ways. And and for me also, I think it's where I am there. <laughs> uh, I'm in his presence. I'm in that realm of being multi-located in the heavenlies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, I'd like to get your thoughts pertaining to uh, how he has just held me and cocooned me. Uh, and kind of kept me. That's one thing. The other is uh, I participate from time to time in various Zoom calls, uh, and I, I hesitate to mention any names because, you know, I know this may be uh, on YouTube, and I wouldn't want anybody to uh, be offended, et cetera. But I'll be on Zoom calls with well-known uh, ministries, that kind of thing. And and what I find is, in a sense, a disappointment because the people 
you know, they know God to the degree that they do. But when when I uh, listen to them and and then all begin to share at times, and and I don't share a lot pertaining to heavenly encounters because you know that really kind of uh, is beyond their experience. They're more into inclusion mm. and uh, knowing God in light of uh, the inclusion teaching that we all have been reconciled and everyone is forgiven, etc. Which certainly I believe in. Uh, but it, it just does concern me. You know, I, God knows, I don't look at myself as superior to anybody. And uh, I, you know, you talked about the Firestones earlier. I'm not aware that I've just really had a lot of that kind of encounter. But what I have had, or what I see, I, years ago I taught uh, what's been called the three stages of the believer uh, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. So there's the little childhood state of the believer where you're in maturity. You begin to come into the joy of the Lord and God fathers you and loves you. And you may be yet struggling with carnal things. Then he says, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. So that's now kind of a uh, adolescent stage. You're beginning to grow and you're beginning to experience overcoming. And I, I see these stages paralleled in, in scripture so many times, particularly in Moses' life, where now he's shepherd, shepherdizing sheep as he's being tutored by God in preparation, this young man stage again. And then God meets him at the burning bush, which I see is the third stage of the believer. He says, I write unto you fathers, mm. because you have known him that is from the beginning, where you now begin to engage in eternal counsels and purposes of God that you were created to. And you don't just have to be ministered to all the time, but you're in a place of ministering and fathering mm -hmm. others, etc. So I guess the, the essence of that question is, um, where are we as a whole in, in many ways in our growth in the body of Christ at various levels and stages? Uh, I, I, you know, I hear you talk about strings that we're all coming to, and I, I certainly see that and agree with that. But I guess those are the two major questions. Me being cuddled mm. by the Lord and just held in intimacy. Uh, and then secondly, more in the overall uh, mm. growth in the body and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, initially, everything comes from that place of abiding in intimacy and relationship, because that's where the Father's heart gets revealed. So that whatever we then do from that place and we can stay in that place, it's not a place we need to ever leave. Because, you know, he's designed us to dwell, to abide in his presence, heart to heart, face to face, mind to mind, which will be the place of revelation and light that will unfold the father's desires and intentions in and around our lives. And therefore, we instinctively, when we live there, know what to do in every situation because we instinctively know the Father's heart because it's we are entangled with that. I might be there, but I'm also here. Therefore, I live from that place, continually entangled and then flowing from that place of intimacy and relationship. And there have been times in my life that have been very specifically what god did in that hugging me keeping me close not allowing me to do what i wanted to do um, because he knew that uh, he wanted to impart more the cardiogenosis knowledge of the heart that i receive from that place and then you know that enables me to brood and be an expression of that and i think that's exactly the place so you know, that is one of the places that I dwell continually. And from a multi-dimensional perspective, everything else is connected to that. Because if I did something independently of that intimacy and, and heart relationship, then I would be doing it out of my own understanding rather than what is being uh, imparted of his knowledge or his heart to me that enables me to, to come out of that. So I think that's exactly the place all of us should be dwell in to abide in not try and you know do anything to understand it or try and figure it out just be just be rest in that place of intimacy it is to me the crucial most important 
aspect of who we are in that relationship it, it is just who god designed us where where he said you know where i am you may be also he was describing that because he was in the father and the father was within him and he said one day that day resurrection day you're gonna know this you're gonna know where i am because that's where i am you may be also you may be in this place of intimacy and abiding where you are only going to do what you see the father doing effectively so i think that's that's absolutely crucial the other side of it is um everyone is on a journey and therefore you know where i would have been many years ago in revelation of certain things without the mystic experience of it is where a lot of people are today but there are also a lot of mystics who don't have the revelation of inclusion or all of that stuff they don't have the revelation of the love of god they may have amazing encounters with god but that doesn't guarantee that they know him and i think some of these guys know more about him by revelation of truth than those people who have amazing encounters actually do otherwise they wouldn't be preaching hell and damnation and other things and there's still many mystics who are not believing the restoration of all things so they don't have that revelation even though they've had many experiences because i think some of their experiences are shaped by what they believe and they can't interpret their experience or what god is revealing because their own mindsets are so strongly opposed to certain things that God is trying to reveal. So I think it's in both sides. And others who have revelation of inclusion, revelation, they may not even be charismatic. But that doesn't matter because they're on a journey towards where God is taking them. They're not at their destination. And of course, most people who are in this path are sort of blinkered to a degree in which they don't see the other streams flowing but then they begin to get glimpses of other people who are saying the same things but they're also adding this to it and adding that to it and then that opens their eyes like whoa and some of them may reject that aspect of it they accept the bits that agree with them and then disagree then reject the bits that don't but those who are becoming mature they're willing to embrace what others bring to the table if you like and begin to partake of it and there were those who came from the eschatology stream who were very sort of quite, you know, a lot of them not really coming from a mystic perspective at all. But they then, if they follow where this is heading, cannot deny the inclusion because the eschatology of what happened at the end of the age also includes, or well, this didn't happen at the end of the ages. It happened then. Therefore, ah, that's changed my whole view of how God deals with us. So they're on that journey, um, but it's OK. And. I would I think you're wise not to say too much, but don't be afraid of saying something that maybe opens their eyes to something new. You know, which is why, you know, we put out all sorts of material, some of it really embracing inclusion and all that perspective and restoration. But we also put out stuff regarding you know our heavenly position and our sonship and our authority in it all and i think all of this will eventually come together and people will begin to embrace all of it whereas at the moment they may embrace one stream of it or two streams of it and some of them you know some of them who are very much in talking about inclusion and grace and the grace awakening network and all those things they're also starting to talk about immortality so god is beginning to unveil well, when you start to engage with that that begins to open a mystic dimension and other things you know so i'm i'm not in at all uh concerned about the fact that some people are where they are because i was where i was you know years ago and even in recent times you know and so that's okay you know i see it as a journey and we're all flowing eventually when those tributaries if you like start to come together into the river you people are going to Whoa, this is more than i'm comfortable with a lot of them and they will and they probably feel that i was 
you know, I mean, I, you know, one of the first things that got deconstructed back in, you know, a initially baptism of the spirit got deconstructed and I began to embrace that. And then that deconstructed eschatology, I had no idea where that would head. And it was years from the mid 80s. You know, to the early 90s to 2010 and beyond were actually that revelation then changed the whole inclusion perspective to realize, ah, this was where this was heading. God could not have given me that revelation back in 1988 or whatever. Then I could not have accepted it. But I was deconstructed eschatology wise. I never saw the link between that and what would happen to people when they died or what was referring to Gehenna and all of those things. Didn't see it as relating, although I must have read it and read it, never saw it. But when the revelation came, it was like, God, God, it's taken 30 odd years for you to get me to this point where I can now see this. I'm like, oh, I wish I'd saw this 30 years ago, but I couldn't. And that's the same for everyone on the journey. It's obvious when you know it and see it and experience it. It really isn't obvious until you do. But I do believe the Grace Awakening Network and those group are beginning to embrace. And there are mystics in that group. And there are those who are have the experiences and are, are able to sort of say, hey, there are next steps. And this is going further. You know, and they, you know, and I'm very encouraged by all of that, you know, because, you know, it's not my responsibility of how quickly they get there. You know, it didn't take me. It took me a long time to get there. You know, things accelerated once I started to engage heaven. But, you know, I still had to embrace the ongoing deconstruction and renewal and changes that took place as a result of it. So, you know, it's to be expected that people will maybe grasp one stream another stream you know and there are those who embrace the whole you know energy healing that type of thing you know who haven't got a clue about eschatology or anything else yet but it will come and there are those who've embraced the energy thing who do have a revelation of inclusion because it's love that's at the basis of it all so they embrace love really easily because they probably don't have the baggage of eschatology and the negative stuff of, you know, and the hell delusion stuff to get rid of as much because they've come from a different direction. But they're encountering God and bringing revelation about how God is in the transition we're in, bringing about healing and helping people come into immortality. There are only a few people that I probably know that have embraced all four streams. But there are some and, you know, a few of them, you know, that I have, I think Lindy, Justin, are begin they're beginning to, we're all beginning to sort of see where this is all going, you know, and I'm encouraged by that. But I wouldn't worry too much about it all. Yes, but sir. Yes, sir. Don't be afraid of dropping in the odd bomb of love and stuff, you know. Um, an encounter because ultimately people these people are going to be able to embrace way way more if it goes beyond the theological into the experiential so yeah i would love for people who who have written books and things on inclusion and people like baxter kruger and brad jerzak and others who would you know and i'm sure william paul young probably has had experiences i would think from you know his writings but probably they're not all sharing them and sometimes people feel if i started to share this now this could cause such a problem that it would you know people aren't ready for it so i think people have experiences and stuff which they're not yet sharing because maybe they don't have permission by god to share it yet but when you get them one-on-one -on -one, and you begin to talk and ask questions, then you begin to find, oh, yeah, they're, they're on this journey. Well, you know, someone like Francois, you know, the Mirror Bible writer, you know, when I started to talk about my experiences with him of encountering heaven, I know because his wife was there. She's had those experiences. You could see it in her face, you know, um, 
And maybe he has had some experiences like that, but maybe that's not his mission to share that. His mission is to do the things that he feels God calling him to do. But hopefully all will eventually end up in the fullness of all of it. Anyway, there we go. Yeah, uh, a couple things where God keeps emphasizing with me is to dwell. He that dwelleth in the secret place to seek to yeah. learn how to stay in that realm yeah, of well, intimacy. And uh, major, that is the major <laughs> that we should uh, emphasize. And then the second one, everybody knows Second Corinthians, they can quote or close to quoting Second Corinthians, what is it? Uh, wow. The scripture, this is therefore for any man being Christ, he's a new creature. That's Second Corinthians, what, 5, 517 is it? Yeah, 5, yeah, 517. Okay. But mm -hmm. most people don't know the preceding verse. Mm -hmm. And that verse, says from henceforth know we no man after the flesh yeah. and not even Jesus after the flesh anymore mm -hmm. so God emphasizes to me again and again his unconditional love and the way he sees everybody okay. regardless of where they are who they are what they're doing what stage they're in as a son as his child and yeah. not to in any way negatively demean them but see them as he does after the image and likeness of God and love them thereby. Absolutely. And for me, I will never look at where someone is without looking at the fact that I've been there too. And I may well be, be back even further behind them in some areas in my life that they have revelation of and experience of that I don't have full revelation of. Therefore, I can learn from them. And we can learn from each other when we embrace each other as, as you say, all sons of God. And therefore, it's not my perspective to judge where they are. It's to embrace them as brothers, sisters, and see how we can all begin to walk together in union and oneness in love. Therefore, I'm not going to argue with them over things that they may not have revelation of, but I would love to get deeper into the stuff that they do because they're going to have stuff in there that i've not even seen yet which is you know for me really exciting that there's opportunity for way way more to come in the future which is awesome anyway if you enjoy these videos would you please take a moment to like comment and subscribe it really does help thank you very much